It's the early 60s and a legion of British bands are ready for action. The Americans have been shooting rock and roll at us over the Atlantic for years and the mop-top troops of the UK are about to return fire. He said they're called the Beatles. But as the British invasion is about to be launched, where will the troops get their weapons? Most things that are worth doing are dangerous. Who will give them the tools to do the job? The distortion factor on it is very, very low indeed. We're about to hear the story of one small company which took on the world with a handful of valves in an old shed in Dartford. They broke the rules. I told him no. And defined the sound of the 60s. It sounded like a rhino being killed. It's a story that begins with bombs and ends in tears. He was crying and I've never seen a man cry before. He was so upset. This is the story of Vox. I'm Ian Lee, and I can tell you that that isn't any old guitar amplifier. It is, in fact, a classic Vox AC30, built by Jennings Musical Industries of Dartford in 1964. Many guitarists say that the AC30 was the best amp ever made. The AC30 really is, is kind of a gift from God. But the sound was so sweet, it really sung, you know. Just, just a wonderful sound. And that, with that box, the AC30, is the first time it all came together. Pop music is my life's passion, but the story of how Dartford powered the British beat boom in the 60s has long been forgotten, even by the people of Dartford. This is how it happened. It was rock and roll which brought us the electric guitar. Before that, things were very different. <laughs> In the 1950s, there was only one thing better than an accordion, and that's two accordions. This TV show was extremely popular, and the squeeze box was all the rage all over the world. Tom Jennings was an accordionist. During the war, he used to work at an armaments factory. There, he met a guitar player called Dick Denny. They would play together in the air raid shelters as the bombs dropped around them. And everybody used to have a sing-song, and so everybody was sort of calm during the air raids. After the war, Tom opened up a music shop in Dartford, where they specialised in refurbishing old accordions. But he wanted to get into manufacturing, not accordions, but something a bit more space-age. What on earth is this? This is the Univox. It was the, uh, the first electronic a uh, product that Jennings produced. Oh, whoa. Steady on. <laughs> it was basically a kind of valve synthesizer. I think it's done. We may, it may be on its last legs. We, we killed it. Rest in peace. Many pop music geeks are convinced that the Univox was the instrument used on the number one single by the Tornadoes, Telstar. Others say it definitely wasn't. But that doesn't matter. The important thing is that Tom Jennings had started to make musical equipment and his next move would define the sound of the 60s. Rock and roll arrived from America. Suddenly, everyone wanted electric guitars, and when they got them, they'd need amplifiers as well. Tom saw his chance and cannibalised the Univox. The Univox had inside it an amplifier, and from this, the first Vox amp called the G10 was developed, and it was basically a reworking of the Univox amp. But it wasn't great. So Tom roped in his old wartime chum, Dick Denny, because Dick knew about electronics and he was also a guitarist. What he came up with used AC electricity and it put out 15 watts of power. So it was called the AC-15. 
and the sound that it made was seized upon by the biggest band in Britain, The Shadows. I don't know who contacted who, but uh, we finished up with Vox AC-15s. People who used to work for Jennings Musical Industries in Dartford will vouch for the fact that the AC-15 was a major step forward. The company was doing okay with Dick Denny's electronic creations and Tom Jennings at the helm. He was a very motivated uh, individual, extremely hardworking, um, good sense of humour. He was a really nice man, Tom was a nice man, very approachable. You know, when he come in, he was the boss. He was also quite volatile. He could go up like a volcano. If things weren't quite going how they should be, he could be, they'd come down just as quick. Dick Denny, what was he like? Very nice man, very, very nice man. He used to wear these cardies and he used to have, have pockets there. And he used to put his hand in his pockets and he used to do these puppets with his liners of his pockets and uh, make out, you know, tell us stories with these puppets. An entertainer, always an entertainer. But the shadows came to Dick with a request about his AC-15. Is there any chance of sort of making this amplifier bigger or louder? Because, you know, the, the kids were screaming at Cliff, you know, you couldn't hear anything. So Dick wanted to make a kind of double amp with two speakers in it. He went to see Tom. No, 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 says Tom. No, no. Too heavy, too loud, you know, too big, all the rest of it. Go away, forget about it. But Dick wasn't taking no for an answer. He began knocking up some twin versions of the AC-15 on the quiet, just to help out bands like The Shadows who wanted more volume. But he got caught out when Tom spotted the paperwork for the parts. Tom looked at it and went, I told him no. Unfortunately, Dick was walking past the office. Door opens, Tom comes out. Dick, in my office, now. Tom and Dick had a huge row. Eventually, the door opens. Out comes Dick, you know, sort of white-faced. We expected him to have his P45s in his hand, and we all said, what happened, Dick? And he said, he says we can make 10, and on my own head be it. And that was the birth of the AC-30. Dick had come up with this. Recognised by many guitarists to this day as the classic of all guitar amplifiers. It, they're just great amplifiers. We could suddenly hear the amps above the, all the screaming. The sound was good. That was your main criteria. The sound had to be good, and the sound was good. It was a vast improvement on any British amp that had come before. Things just seemed to come right in it. It met all the molecules of the, of the whole amplifier, and the guitar seemed to join up into the right, into line up into this most beautiful kind of order. So, what's the difference between the Vox sound and its main competitors, the Fender and the Marshall? The Fender sound is all uh, clean, lots of bass, lots of treble, and it's the sound of America in the 60s. Let's go over to the Marshall. What does that sound like? Bigger box, more power, more distortion. This is rock. The Vox, what's so distinctive about that sound? OK, it's a very different kind of circuit. Uh, clean, clean, glassy. For me, at least, the Vox is all about Hank. Things were going quite well but Vox had no idea what was about to hit them. It began when the manager of an unknown band walked into their retail shop in London. His band was a bit hard up, and he said he wanted some amplification. I said, well, we can sell you that. So he said, no, I don't want to buy it. I want you to give it to them. 
Oh. So, it, uh, who is this band? He said, they're called the Beatles. They've been playing in the Star Club in Hamburg. I said, I see. I said, well, we don't give stuff away. So he said, yeah, but the advertising that you'll get from this will be enormous. So Reg got on the phone to the governor, Tom Jennings, who didn't take kindly to the idea. Do what? He said, screaming over the phone. What do you think we are, some philanthropic society? He used a stronger word, but I censored that. He said, who is this crowd? So I said, they're, they're called the Beatles. He said, that's not a very good name for a start. Nevertheless, Reg did a part exchange deal with the cash strap manager, Brian Epstein, who made him a promise. Whilst I'm manager of the Beatles, he said they will never use anything else other than Vox. And they never did. <laughs> Within a year, Vox found themselves being promoted by the biggest band of all time. How much did that cost? Absolutely nothing. Back in Dartford, sometime in the mid-60s, a potential customer was worried that the Vox valves would be too fragile to go on the road. Were they reliable? So we rolled it down three flights of stone steps. <laughs> Took it back up on the lift plugged it in and Dick could play it through perfectly. Uh, so is, it, is that reliable enough for you? <laughs> Simultaneously, there was another product of Kent that was about to hit the big time. No, you weren't, Mick. You were born in Dartford. In fact, Mick Jagger was born here at the Livingston Hospital in 1943, and so was Keith Richards. 19 years later, Mick and Keith met on the Dartford train. They got together with a bunch of other teenage musicians, and they formed the Rolling Stones. The Stones then began a very close relationship with Vox, one of their early managers, Eric Easton, used to work at the company. Their early gigs were a showcase of Vox equipment. So Vox products were fully endorsed by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Shadows, and practically every big name you could mention. They were a hit, and the orders flooded in. Lord knows this town was already glamorous enough, but that's how Dartford became the powerhouse of British rock and roll. We went down to Dartford, I think, a couple of times, uh, obviously to meet Dick, um, see w where they did it all. The switchboard put us straight through to this guy who said, hi, Dick here. He was more, almost more enthusiastic than we were. We could go to Dartford and they'd literally say, yeah, whatever you want. All through the 60s, it was like, it was like Christmas every day. It just felt like Christmas. We had all the pop groups, the Hollies, the Searchers, you name it, like the animals. I mean, and some of them are so rude. We know that Vox sounds different, but what makes it sound different? Some say it's the Celestian Blue G12 speakers that some of the models had. Some say it's the EL84 valves. But many put it down to a thing called no negative feedback. This is how it works. If you have a hi-fi reproducing equipment, the idea is you want the speaker just to produce what you put in. 
In other words, in a hi-fi, you must have as little distortion as possible. You must have one of these better class units, which has uh, ultra-linear output stages. The distortion factor on it is very, very low indeed. Now, any amplifier is going to have some distortion, but there is a method of getting over that called negative feedback. Hi-fi systems have a lot of negative feedback, so they only produce what you give them. But what Dick Denny realised was that if you take the negative feedback out of a guitar amplifier and allow the amp and speaker to interact and distort, it actually makes an electric guitar sound better. What it does is, in fact, it emphasises the harmonics. So the combination of the guitar and the emphasis of the extra harmonics gives you this fantastic AC30 sound. And what the Vox guys very cleverly did was just take off all the negative feedback. So you get a curve which goes up and is straight and then gradually goes into distortion. And it's that gradual curve which is the sound which I was looking for. So Brian takes the Hank Marvin clear sound and pushes it into distortion. At low volume, it's very nice and clean like we were talking about. Yeah. You can hear every note very really clear as crystal. If you, if you edge it up a little bit, it'll start to go into that kind of creamy saturation, which I'll show you. So that's halfway. But yeah, if you go that's that, halfway. That's, that's sort of halfway up. That gives you the sort of... Okay. So then, then the whole... So you're starting like... So a number of things happen. It gets yeah. more distorted and, and the chords... Oh, what a sound, though. What a rich sound It gets from that it. lovely, rich, kind of throaty sound mm. which seems to come from here. And as Vox took off, their engineers would find themselves rubbing shoulders with the big stars. Alan Harding would go on tour with the Beatles to look after their amps. One day, he was in their dressing room on Paul McCartney's 21st birthday. We had two big security guards come staggering up with this giant box, and it was kind of the outline of 21. Yeah, big, the big guys, and they straggled with it and got it on the table. Then somehow they kind of unzipped it, and it fell apart, and this scantily clad bird come wandering out, <laughs> walking around the tabletop as a present for Paul. <laughs> I don't know if, if he accepted it and took it home, but it was certainly on the table. <laughs> In the years since, guitarists with a whole range of styles have loved the AC30. And that's where you can see the distortion just starts to get. But it isn't enough because obviously all guitarists want the sound a bit longer. Sustain, that's kind of sweet and natural sustain. And obviously after that we wanted more and more gain circuits and drive circuits to make us uh, spinal tappy sustain and stuff. These two pickups set against each other, yeah. out of phase, then the Bohemian Rhapsody sort of, sort of really? sound is like this kind of... Well, instead of this, which is normal, sort of my normal setting... <laughs> It'll go like this to uh... It's got so much natural harmonics going for it. Made me so happy there, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then the amp kind of brings it out, you know, the, yeah. the whole thing. The whole system brings out those high harmonics, so it sounds like an octave higher than it really is. Many young musicians today prefer the Vox sound. I don't know what that does. <laughs> but sometimes find the amps to be a bit unreliable. What the hell is no, no, this? No, that's just like... <laughs> it's recording, I turned it on and it made the most outrageous sound. It sounded like a rhino being killed. <laughs> and I had to turn it off and like blow on it and like pat it and tell it to be good and then <laughs> managed to get my take out. Of course, Vox once did their special test to show their amps were reliable. But has Brian May ever had any problems? Oh, nothing's ever gone wrong. <laughs> I don't believe you for um, a second, Mr May. No, no, well, vowels don't travel well, right. and that is that has been a problem. 
valves are delicate and mm. they'll suddenly splutter and uh, peg out on you without any warning. You just have to be prepared and we have a couple of spares. Um, it's worth it. Most things that are worth doing mm. are dangerous and risky and uh, there is an element of risk to the old mm. uh, the valve amps. Back in the early 60s, Brian Jones, Keith Richards and the rest of the lads were obviously making a right old song and dance about Vox amps. And the Stones went one step further than the Beatles and the Shadows. They used the guitars as well. Vox weren't just making the AC30. They made all sorts of variations of the amplifier. And on top of that, they started producing a whole range of musical instruments, such as the Vox Continental Keyboard and lots and lots of guitars. This is a Vox Phantom. This was uh, Vox's first original design. It was a radical design when it came out, and I guess it still is. Mm. And Brian Jones loved the next model, the Teardrop. Brian Jones tuning up. However, the thing about Vox guitars is, they weren't very good. Yeah, that's true. A lot of the early Vox guitars were Fender copies, and they were very poor Fender copies, and they didn't play well. Over the years, you know, by the mid-60s, Vox had set out to rectify this reputation. By that time, they were making some quite playable, quite good guitars. While all this was going on, Vox were in fact making history. Vox amplifiers in the early 60s were very, very important because they were the sound of the British invasion. The bands such as the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Hollies, um, these bands were using um, not only the Vox amplifiers, but in some cases the Vox guitars. The guitars themselves were radical designs, the Phantom and the Mark III, these beautiful pentagonal shapes or teardrop shapes. They helped to create the new look that the British acts were introducing. By now, Vox were breaking into America. They came to a deal with the Thomas Organ Company to license making their amps in the States. Okay, that's our turn. To promote the brand, they did what only Americans would do. They built a car with amps embedded inside it, the Voxmobile. And this thing has 32 guitar inputs. It can handle a bass, a guitar, has a continental organ on the back. They take it around in music stores around the country where kids could try out all their favorite Vox equipment. Vox were now so big that when Dick Denny came up with what must be his maddest invention, the guitar organ, he was invited to go on American television. Mr. Dick Denny, here he is. They wanted him to explain how it worked. The idea is to make a guitar sound like an organ. Oh, well, and we certainly did that. As uh, generators inside, which, as you press the notes down, it makes electrical contact. Way down upon the swimming river, far, far away. When you find yourself singing on network TV in the States, you know your company must be a success. Rains did this arrangement here, huh? <laughs> This is the only known footage of Dick. Of course, Vox supplied the Beatles with equipment, but they catered for other big stars as well, such as a custom keyboard for Sooty. It was a two manual thing. The, the bottom one actually played notes, and then the top one, you pressed things and springs came out, and things blew up and all the rest it's of it. precision engineering that makes Sooty go with a bang. Following the success of the amplifiers, Dick Denny started experimenting with gadgets which would further change the sound of the guitar. Dick slumbered into our studio, because he used to sit down on the desk and have a coffee, with this OXO box. And he plugged the guitar in this OXO box with the amplifier. And he played this terrible distortion guitar. It was like, eh, 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 eh. And we said, Dick, all the years Vox have been trying to get a clean sound, and you've devised this racket, you know. And he said, trust me, bruv. Trust me, it'll go. And within four weeks, the Rolling Stones made satisfaction, which went. Ah, 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 ah. And so the Vox Buzzbox was born. But while Dick Denny was in Dartford messing with the sound of the guitar, the Rolling Stones were on the road messing with Alan Harding's head. Tell me about breakfast with the Rolling Stones. Well, 
they used to embarrass me because they quite often, they would come down, at least one or two of them, would come down with women's dresses on, like long frocks or something, yeah? And I used to be embarrassed and I used to drift to the other side of the restaurant. Why were they dressed in oh, women's clothes? They, they, no. well, I think the drugs used to have a, uh, a, 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 a telling on the night before, probably. Any of the Vox employees in the 60s could suddenly find themselves hanging out with superstars. Well, I was a sales assistant uh, for the Vox shop in Chalkers Road at the time, and Jimi Hendrix came in. So he's trying out some effects pedals and things. I asked him if he could show me how to play Purple Haze. So he said, yeah, sure, no problem. Next thing you know, he was, after 10 seconds, was showing me how to play it. It's amazing, I got a free lesson off Jimi Hendrix. And the Vox sound suits many of today's musicians. I went on tour with one of my friends and played through his box one night and I was like, this is so amazing, this is perfect. I would say that a box has kind of a warmth to it, especially um, my experience has been with the vintage ones. There's like that warmth that's kind of similar to vinyl. At its peak, Vox were employing about 150 people and were subcontracting out work to several other companies. Vox were flying high. They couldn't make their products fast enough. What could possibly go wrong? The business was so big, the factory here couldn't cope. Tom Jennings desperately needed money to fund the manufacture and keep up with demand. So he sold a controlling interest in his company to the Royston Group. They were a series of military electronics companies. One of their main products was the new black box, which records what happens when a plane crashes. But it was a bad move. Instead of giving Vox money, they were in fact draining money out of the company to help finance this research and development on the black box. But then they lost the black box contract altogether. And that was the end of the Royston Group. Royston went down and took Vox with them. The workers carried on, oblivious to the fact that the receivers were meeting with Tom. He came literally from the boardroom and he said, the adjective, adjective, uh, guys have fired me, you know, I'm out. And he had tears rolling down his cheeks. I'll never forget the day he left, he was crying. He said, I've lost my company, I said, I know. And he was crying and I've never seen a man cry before, he was so upset. And so the Jennings era of Vox came to an end. Tom Jennings took Dick Denny and a few other Vox employees and started all over again with a new company making the Jennings brand of amplifiers. But they weren't anywhere near as successful. Of course, Vox didn't disappear. Over the last 40 years, the brand was sold on through a series of companies and today is owned by Korg. The amplifiers are made in China. The people who used to work for Vox in the 60s have fond memories about their time in Dartford. I've never been in a job since that I, I loved so much. We were all so excited and we thoroughly all enjoyed our jobs. Going to work every day was a joy, it was a joy. And any guitarist worth his salt will kill to get his hands on a genuine 60s Valve Jennings Musical Industries Vox AC30. Made at the time when Dartford found itself at the centre of rock and roll. Stay with us here on BBC4. We've got an electric prom from Paul McCartney coming up in just a few moments. <laughs>